That is all in for this evening. The Rachel Maddow Show starts right now. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Chris. I'm like filing at my desk. I'm like, I've got... (laughs) (laughs) There's lots of paper. I've got some exhibits. I've got some other filings. (laughs) Well, I'm confused. I'm going to watch the Rachel Maddow Show to get a better sense of what happened because I... I do this for a living, but I, I'm confused by what got filed today. Well, I'll so. tell, I will tell you the Cliff Notes version of it is that one really important thing happened with Manafort and an intriguing thing, but okay. something really important happened in the Roger Stone case of all things today. It had nothing to do with that dumb gag order. Um, right, with the, with, with the warrant, with, what, what we learned about the warrant. Yeah, and the, okay. um, and the thing that happened in the Michael Cohen t- case today, too, which came out of Congress, that's also a big deal. This was like a real triple whammy. This is worth watching. I think it I think it'd be very funny if I got a private version of the Rachel A block every day, just like <laughs> 60 second digest right at the top when I, during the throw. You come into my office at any time. If you hide under my desk for right. any 15 second Perfect. period of time, I mumble enough to get most of it out. <laughs> thanks, my friend. Have a great weekend. Uh, and thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. This is one of those Fridays. Um, and as I mentioned to Chris, there is um, sort of a triple whammy going on right now in terms of the Russia investigation and big legal developments tonight. Uh, but there's a lot of different types of type of news that we are watching tonight. For example, we are still getting in new reporting tonight about the mass shooting that took place today in Aurora, Illinois. Um, What we know now is at least five people dead, multiple others injured from this mass shooting. It took place at a manufacturing plant in Aurora, Illinois, keeping in mind that initial reports from major mass shootings are often later revised in terms of our factual understanding what happened. Um, With that caveat, I should tell you that preliminary reports make it seem as if what happened here was a single shooter, a 45-year-old man. He was ultimately killed by police. Authorities tell us that of the people who were shot and injured in this mass shooting, at least five were police officers themselves. So again, that means we think we're talking about five injured police officers, five non-police officers, five civilians killed, and the shooter himself killed on top of that. So we are watching that story as it continues to develop. We will let you know more as we learn more. Today started, of course, with the president declaring a national emergency to try to give himself a a sort of legal way to take money, mostly from the military, to build a wall between us and Mexico, despite the the fact that Congress will not appropriate the money that the president wants for that purpose. Uh, Immediately upon declaring this emergency today, the president, in what appeared to be a little bit of an ad lib, he blurted out, I didn't need to do this. I kid you not, that's an exact quote. I didn't need to do this. That's not the right thing to say if you are trying to convey the idea that you really did have to do this because this is supposedly some kind of emergency that's forcing your hand. Uh, Almost immediately after he said, I didn't need to do this, uh, the president then went on to the rest of his presidential day, which culminated in him him this afternoon, getting on a plane and flying to Florida to, we think, go play golf for the whole weekend, which is fine, nothing against golf, but again, it's just not on message when you're supposed to be proclaiming a stop, drop, and roll, everybody freak out, crisis moment for the country. If it's an emergency... Is it okay that you're going to go golfing for the rest of the day? Shouldn't you be handling the emergency? Or is the emergency actually something, like you said, that you didn't need to proclaim? Uh, Suffice to say, there is a near national consensus that the emergency the president proclaimed today does not exist in reality. Uh, Protesters outside of one of the Trump properties in New York City tonight proclaimed that they believe, however, that there is an emergency. Their chant tonight was, Trump is the emergency. Trump is the emergency. We'll have more on that later on in the show tonight. But in the front row um, of the national emergency announcement today, for what it was worth, uh, there was a new face, one who we are all going to see a lot of from here on out. Today was the first full day on the job for the new attorney general, William Barr, who was confirmed by the Senate yesterday. Upon him being sworn in last night in the Oval Office, the husband of a top White House staffer posted this comment online, quote, tomorrow will be the first day that the president will have a fully operational confirmed attorney general. Let that sink in. Mueller will be gone soon. I don't know what it means to be a fully operational attorney general. Um, But since that comment is coming from a person who is married to a senior White House staffer, that at least serves as 
some evidence of what the White House may be expecting from Bill Barr now that he is taking over at the Justice Department. Um, and it, it may be so. Maybe now that Bill Barr has started as attorney general, maybe Mueller will be gone soon. Uh, but Mueller was definitely still at work today. Part of the reason I said uh, right at the top here that this is one of those days when a lot is going on all at once is that th three big things happened in quick succession this afternoon and into tonight on three big cases that derive from Mueller's investigation. The biggest one is the one that came down latest, late tonight, concerning the president's campaign chair, Paul Manafort. There was this dramatic ruling earlier this week, you'll remember, in which a federal judge in D.C. declared that Manafort, in fact, did breach his cooperation agreement with prosecutors. The judge ruled that, in fact, Manafort intentionally lied to prosecutors about important things, about matters that were material to their investigation, including the extent of his contacts with someone who prosecutors say is linked to Russian intelligence. So that ruling happened a couple of days ago this week. After that ruling this week, prosecutors in the special counsel's office moved quickly to start the process of Manafort finally getting sentenced for his crimes. Now, Manafort is facing sentencing both in the Eastern District of Virginia, which is where he had his trial. That's where he was convicted of eight felonies. He's also facing sentencing in Washington, D.C. That's the court where he pled guilty to two felonies and started what was supposed to be his deal with prosecutors, which he blew up by lying to them. Well, tonight we've just received the recommendation from Mueller's office as to how much time they think Manafort should spend in prison based just on the eight felony counts for which he was convicted in Virginia. So separate and apart from whatever he might get in D.C., Mueller's prosecutors are recommending that the president's campaign chairman spend between 19 and a half years and 24 and a half years in prison. Again, just for the felonies for which he was convicted in Virginia, separate and apart from what he's going to get in D.C. Now, for a man who is about to turn 70, that means prosecutors are recommending what is, in effect, a natural life sentence for Paul Manafort. You will recall that there is no parole in the federal prison system. So 19 to 24 years. Um, we're going to get to that Manafort situation in a little more detail in a second. Um, but the sentencing recommendation from these prosecutors, it, it not only spells out what they're hoping to get from the judge in Virginia in terms of Manafort's sentence, what's interesting about it, what's worth taking a closer look at in terms of the prosecutor's memo tonight, is that they also, in making this case to the judge, they summarize what they believe to have been Manafort's crimes and their seriousness and whether or not he's done other things on top of those crimes that mean that he should have even more of the book thrown at him. So it is worth looking at that in detail, and we're going to get there in just a moment. Before we do that, though, we shouldn't let the sort of magnitude of what just happened with the president's campaign chair, um, we shouldn't let that push aside a couple of other really important things that happened today before we got the Manafort sentencing memo. So there's a couple other things that basically got ripe and fell off the tree today when it comes to two other cases that derive from Mueller's investigation. And the first one is about Roger Stone, President Trump's longtime advisor. He was arrested at his home in Florida three weeks ago today. Mr. Stone has pled not guilty to seven felony charges. He says he wants to go to trial. He says he is innocent of everything he has been charged with. But one of the interesting things about Roger Stone's indictment right from the get-go was that on the front page of that indictment, prosecutors notified the court that they considered his case to have a sibling. They considered his case to be formally legally related to this other case that has this, this case number that you could see here, 18 CR 215. That case is the Mueller indictment of a dozen Russian military intelligence officers. That case is the GRU indictment. One of the core indictments of Mueller's investigation was that GRU indictment from last year. In that indictment, Mueller charged Russian military intelligence officers with, quote, conspiring to hack into the computers of U.S. persons and entities involved in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, to steal documents from those computers, and to stage releases of the stolen documents to interfere with the 2016 presidential election. That's how Mueller's prosecutors have sort of nutted up that indictment. That's what those GRU officers were charged with. Now, Roger Stone and his attorneys had objected to the Roger Stone case being formally legally linked to the GRU case. They had complained about it formally to the court. 
Why do they care? Well, one of the material consequences of having your case legally linked to another case is that all legally, formally related cases all get heard by the same judge. So when Roger Stone and his lawyer started complaining to the court that his case shouldn't have been described as related to the GRU indictment, what they were really saying is that they didn't want Roger Stone's case to be heard by the same judge who's dealing with the GRU case. He was effectively arguing that he wanted to be assigned to a different judge. Uh, Roger Stone and his lawyers today failed in that effort. That same judge is keeping his case. That ruling from the judge came very quickly today after Robert Mueller and the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office filed a response with the court laying out why, in fact, the Roger Stone case and the GRU case are all about the same thing. And in the course of making that argument to the court, we learned from the special counsel's office today that some of the GRU defendants, some of these Russian military intelligence officers who have been charged by Mueller for interfering in the election, some of those defendants, according to prosecutors, quote, interacted directly with Roger Stone concerning stolen materials posted online. Prosecutors also explain how they ended up with evidence against Roger Stone when they seized material for the Russian military intelligence case. Quote, as alleged in the GRU indictment, in 2016, the GRU defendants stole documents from the DNC, the Democratic Party, from the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and from the Clinton campaign chair. Those defendants then released many of the stolen documents, including through a website maintained by WikiLeaks. In the course of investigating that activity, the government obtained and executed dozens of search warrants on various accounts used to facilitate the transfer of stolen documents for release, as well as to discuss the timing and promotion of their release. Several of those search warrants were executed on accounts that contained Roger Stone's communications. His communications with Guccifer 2.0, a fictitious online persona created by the GRU. Um, they said they also obtained Stone's communications with WikiLeaks. Quote, evidence obtained from those search warrants resulted in the allegations that the GRU defendants hacked and stole documents for release through intermediaries, including WikiLeaks, and that Stone lied to a congressional committee investigating, among other things, the activities of WikiLeaks regarding those stolen documents. So the same search warrant turned up the evidence that led to the charges against these Russian military intelligence officers, that they hacked and stole documents for release during the campaign. They used WikiLeaks as part of their distribution channel for doing that. That same search warrant also turned up the information that led to Stone being charged for lying to Congress about their investigation of, among other things, WikiLeaks. So that's Mueller's prosecutors today telling a federal judge in Washington, D.C. that they've got the communications between Roger Stone and Russian military intelligence. They've also got the communication between Roger Stone and WikiLeaks concerning these stolen Democratic documents that the Russian hacked and then staged for distribution during the campaign in a way that was designed to cause maximum damage to Hillary Clinton and maximum benefit to Donald Trump. Upon getting that argument and those declarations from Robert Mueller and the special counsel's office explaining all the links between Roger Stone and Russian military intelligence that they turned up through their evidentiary searches. <laughs> the judge then promptly ruled against Roger Stone. No, she is not giving up that case. She will be hearing that case because it is related to the GRU case. Clearly, these two cases are related matters. So that happened today. And then, soon thereafter, a curveball development in the criminal case that derives from the Mueller investigation that concerns President Trump's longtime attorney, Michael Cohen. Now, Cohen, as you know, is about to start a federal prison sentence early next month for multiple felony charges, including, including two campaign finance felonies. He's going to prison for three years. Those campaign finance felonies he's going to jail for concern about a quarter million dollars in hush money that was paid to two different women ahead of the 2016 election to prevent those women from going public with their allegations that they'd had extramarital affairs with Donald Trump. And I, I know that of all the things that President Trump is potentially implicated in in all of these scandals, the hush money to the ladies thing, it is of everything, it just doesn't feel like the thing that should be following him home every night, looking more and more like a metaphorical grim reaper all the time, right? But think about everything that that 
alleged crime. Well, that confessed crime when it comes to Michael Cohen. Think about all of the things that have fallen apart and that are in jeopardy because of that one pair of felonies. His longtime personal attorney, Michael Cohen, is going to prison for that. And he has effectively flipped against the president and become a cooperating witness for the special counsel's office on the way to that prison sentence. And as part of that prosecution of that case, when it came to Michael Cohen, prosecutors identified the president as individual one, as the person who not only benefited from those campaign finance felonies, but who directed that those felonies be committed. Those crimes, of course, also touch on the president's campaign, since the president's campaign was the beneficiary of those illegal contributions. It also touches on a company called AMI, the publisher of the National Enquirer supermarket tabloid. AMI was involved in the commission of one of those felonies. That firm and its executives are being looked at by prosecutors right now for having potentially violated the cooperation agreement they entered into with prosecutors to avoid being prosecuted themselves for their role in one of those felonies. AMI agreed as part of that non-prosecution agreement that they would commit no other crimes for at least three years. Prosecutors are now reportedly looking at whether, in fact, AMI has committed other crimes since entering into that agreement. If so, that non-prosecution agreement with AMI is blown up, and that company and its executives may be liable not just for their confessed role in that campaign finance felony that's sending Michael Cohen to prison, but for anything else they disclose to prosecutors over the course of their cooperation as well. Eek. That same crime, however small it may seem, it also implicates the president's business, the Trump organization, since the Trump organization appears to be the entity through which some of those illegal campaign funds were effectively laundered. We know that the chief financial officer for the Trump organization has been cooperating, at least to some extent, with prosecutors on this matter, and he may have secured for himself an immunity deal in relation to that cooperation. And now on top of all of that, still deriving from those same felonies, now, tonight, Congressman Elijah Cummings, the estimable chairman of the House Oversight Committee in the House, has just published these 19 pages of notes. Some of them are typed, a lot of them are redacted, some of them are hand scrawled and very hard to read. These are notes from the Office of Government Ethics. Congressman Cummings has released these notes. He has also released to the public a letter to a Trump Organization lawyer. He's also released to the public another letter that he has sent to the new White House counsel. Those letters demand information related to those hush money payments. And those letters make the explosive allegation that it's not just Michael Cohen, that two additional Trump lawyers, one who worked in the White House and another lawyer who represents Trump in a personal capacity, uh, she was actually the one who orchestrated that stunt during the transition where, where Trump sat there by the big piles of papers and supposedly handed over control of his business to his sons. Uh, the lawyer who orchestrated that and another lawyer who lurked and worked in the White House, according to Elijah Cummings tonight, they may themselves be in trouble for making false statements about those hush money payments. Quote, New documents obtained by the committee from the Office of Government Ethics describe false information provided by the lawyers representing President Trump, including Sherry Dillon, President Trump's personal attorney, and Stephen Pasatino, former Deputy White House Counsel for Compliance and Ethics, eek, who has now left the White House to represent the Trump Organization. President Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, is now going to prison in part for his role in these hush money payments. During his guilty plea, Mr. Cohen said he did this in coordination with and at the direction of the president for the principal purpose of influencing the election. Congressman Cummings continues, quote, it now appears that President Trump's other attorneys at the White House and in private practice may have provided false information about these payments to federal officials. This raises significant questions about why some of the president's closest advisors made these false claims and the extent to which they, too, were acting at the direction of or in coordination with the president. One of the president's lawyers is already going to prison for his role in covering up those hush money payments. Now, here's a couple more who Elijah Cummings says are potentially on the hook related to those payments as well. And not just the payments in their case, but the cover-up of the payments. So the Cohen prosecution on the hush money payments, Cohen being prosecuted for those campaign finance felonies, 
him being prosecuted for those campaign finance felonies and naming the president as the person who directed him to commit those felonies. That is dramatic enough on its own terms. But that case is turning out to be a legal nightmare for lots of other individuals and entities that surround the president from his business life, from his political life before he got elected, and even now from his life as president. This is all today. <laughs> so, dramatic developments today on the Roger Stone case, on the Michael Cohen case and related cases. But as I mentioned, the, the really big kahuna tonight is what just happened to the president's campaign chair, to Paul Manafort with prosecutors telling one of the two federal judges who is due to sentence him soon that they want a 19 to 24 year prison term for him, plus potentially tens of millions of dollars in fines and restitution. The implications of this are not just bad for Paul Manafort. In some cases, they are revelatory. And that story is next. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.